Hello, and welcome to Advice from the Experts. Minority youth with disabilities share program improvement opportunities with SILS. We are so glad you could join us today. My name is Kimberly Aguilar. I'm a health equity researcher with Mathematica. I'm also a blind person, so a member of the disability community, and I am dedicated to equitable, accessible, and inclusive practices. Next slide. Okay, so we have a few little housekeeping details here. We are recording today's presentation, so it can be viewed on demand. We have captioning and American Sign Language interpreters. You can view the captioning by selecting the CC tab on the Zoom platform. You can make the box larger by clicking the arrow in the top right-hand corner. And if you'd like to have a larger font, you can check out the full screen cart captioning. You can find the link to the cart in the chat box. If you'd like to pose questions for us to address at the end of our presentation today, you can drop those in the Q&A box or you can email them to jose.vega at memorialherman.org. That is J-O-S-E dot V-E-G-A at M-E-M-O-R-I-A-L-H-E-R-M-A-N-N -N dot O-R-G. Believe it or not, that was actually the shortest email address on our team. Next slide. So funding for MySIL is provided by the Disability and Rehabilitation Research Project on Minority Youth and Centers for Independent Living at Hunter College, City University of New York. This project is jointly funded as a cooperative agreement between the Office of Independent Living Programs and the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research, both in the Administration for Community Living, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The contents do not necessarily represent the policy of the Department of Health and Human Services, and you should not assume endorsement by the federal government. Next slide. Okay, so here's what we have planned for our time today. It's going to be action packed. We'll provide some background of the MySIL project, share highlights from youth focus groups, including ways that SILs can conduct effective outreach, how SILs can keep youth from racial and ethnic minority backgrounds engaged, and highlight youth focus group participants program and activity recommendations for SILs. You'll hear expert perspectives from youth participants and SIL leadership. And finally, we'll leave some time for audience Q&A at the end. Next slide. So we have a whole team of presenters today. My Mathematica colleague, Laura McDermott, will co-facilitate, and Joey Vega from the Independent Living Research Utilization, ILRU, will facilitate our Q&A section. Next slide. And as I mentioned earlier, you will hear directly from three out-of-school youth participants, Oliver Olivia, Aditya Singh, and Apple Gabriel. Next slide. And we are also excited to hear from Amanda Riekert, the MySIL Project Officer. Dr. Sharon McGlynn and Wire is the Executive Director for the Center for Independence of the Disabled New York, or SIDNEY. Michael Hanna is the Equip Coordinator at ABLE South Carolina. And Barbara Anderson is the Independent Living Specialist for the Southern Illinois Center for Independent Living. Next slide. And with that, I will now hand it over to Amanda Riekert for a few remarks on the MySIL project. Thanks, Kimberly. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, as she said, my name is Amanda Riekert, and I am a project officer at NIDLER, the funding agency for, this pro for the MySIL project. I'm so excited to see you all here today supporting this important work. Uh, transition from school to post-secondary life can be a challenging experience for youth, as I'm sure you all know. And we know from research that youth with disabilities are less likely than their non-disabled peers to successfully negotiate this transition from school to post-secondary life. Additionally, youth with disabilities who are out of secondary school are less likely to be engaged in the community through employment, 
education or job training than their same age peers without disabilities. Unfortunately, the, these, the disparities in these communities, community outcomes are larger for youth with disabilities from racial and ethnic minority populations. The, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, or WIOA, passed in 2014 by Congress, included amendments to the Rehab Act or Rehabilitation Act that are relevant to both NIDLER and the Independent Living Administration, both within ACL. One of the amendments required Centers for Independent Living to offer new core services to facilitate the transition of youth who are individuals with significant disabilities who were eligible for individualized education programs under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act and who have completed their secondary education or otherwise left school to post-secondary life. Nidler and ILA authorized under the Rehab Act have complementary interests. So this um, WIOA, these, these amendments through WIOA offered us an opportunity to partner to address the racial and ethnic disparities in transition outcomes for youth with disabilities. Specifically, we decided in 2019 to offer joint funding to generate new research-based knowledge on interventions that are effective and culturally relevant for youth with disabilities from racial and ethnic minority backgrounds that lead to improved transition outcomes. So here we are today, uh, four years later, and um, happily Hunter College and Mathematica through their MySIL work um, were awarded this funding. And this is uh, important, notable, because it is a collaboration between Nidler and, AL and ILA. And it's also the largest uh, disability and rehabilitation research project we've ever offered. I think we're all in for wonderful learning opportunity today. I'm really looking forward to it myself. And I thank you for your interests in and support for this important topic and the remarkable work of the MySIL project. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. So on the next slide, we have just a few more details about the MySIL goals. So to generate new knowledge on effective best practices for out-of-school youth, that's ages 14 to 24 with disabilities from ethnic and racial minority backgrounds, to provide technical assistance to increase SIL's capacity to adopt those evidence-based practices, to facilitate learning collaboratives for SIL training, capacity building, and knowledge exchange, disseminate promising and innovative practices, and engage a community advisory group to inform MySIL research and learning activities. Next slide. So we engaged three SIL partners to recruit for focus group participants in their regions. In addition to Sydney, ABLE South Carolina and Southern Illinois Center for Independent Living participated in a MySIL Learning Collaborative and they agreed to support this task. So we conducted three vir virtual focus groups with 26 out of school youth from racial and ethnic minority backgrounds in June of 2022. Next slide. So on this slide, we shared our research questions. We wanted to learn how SILs can better engage out-of-school youth with disabilities from racial and ethnic minority backgrounds. We wanted to learn about what factors support or hinder these youth's engagement with SILs, what unique or innovative approaches SILs have used to improve outreach and engagement with this population. And then finally, we want to understand the role that SILs could play in assisting youth in the future. Next slide. So the first important theme that youth educated us about were ways that SILs can conduct effective outreach. Next slide. And now we will let you hear from some of this expert advice directly from an out-of-school youth participant from our Sydney focus group. So this video clip is from Aditya. Hi everyone, my name is Aditya Singh. 
Uh, I live in New York City, and my main hobbies uh, I like to play football. I like to listening to songs, watch movies, and and my future goal is to get a college degree in data science. So yeah, that's a brief introduction about me. Thank you. Yeah. Can you talk about the kinds of announcements or invitations that make you feel interested in learning more about a program or going to an activity? Yeah, I'm definitely interested in learning more about these activities because uh, as I'm a person with disability, it will help me uh, to, know, to know more about these programs. And I also make other people share about these programs as well. And uh, I also, I can also voice my opinion in these activities and it will it will also create an, a positive impact in the community uh, by raising my opinion so the help that i can do from my studies i think invaluable so yeah i guess it's can you tell us where you're most likely to hear about programs or activities in your community i would like to know more about these programs through social media like uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, through TV, radio, and other community organizations. So, yeah. And what advice or tips do you have for organizations who are trying to reach out-of-school youth with disabilities from minority backgrounds with programs? My some advice for some those organizations is they should emphasize more on the youth with disabilities that that what they can do and what uh, rather than their disabilities. Uh, they can partner with some NGOs and uh, when they conduct some focus group or meetings, they should mention the purpose of the group, why it is conducted and how it will help the people with disabilities. So yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Aditya, that was excellent. So we had planned to write a practice brief based on our focus group findings. And we ended up writing three because our youth had so many wonderful nuggets and tips and insights that we wanted to highlight. So in this slide, we share key takeaways about effective outreach. So first youth said, Share clear information about programs and activities through social media platforms, still websites, and with community partners. They said highlight the content, the structure, and the purpose of meetings or programs in outreach materials. So youth want to understand what to expect and what they might gain out of attending and consider incentives for participation, like refreshments or gift cards. Next slide. So now for a SILS perspective, I invite Dr. Sharon McLennan Wire from Sydney to share some thoughts. Thank you so much for joining us, Sharon. Could you please share your kind of communication and outreach strategies that your SIL uses to reach both existing customers and people with disabilities who aren't involved in your SIL yet? Um, sure. Thank you for having me. Um, again, my name is Dr. Sharma I'm going to wear it from Sydney. Um, so yes, we have, uh, we're fortunate to have a myriad of federal, state, foundation, and city contracts, which allows us to have a very, very robust um, publication or advertisement budget. So when we're advertising, we have the luxury of using billboards um, on the roadways of New York City. We do a lot of bus advertisements. Um, also, we do um, advertisements in the subway because a lot of our participants take some mass transit. So we use the subway as a way to advertise on our, our, our organization and programs. We also do a uh, mailing flyers where we mail out to a, a set of zip codes that we know that people with disabilities live in throughout the five boroughs of New York City. We also use social media. Um, we also have a, a monthly newsletter um, that goes out to all our consumers. We have a list of participants as well as organizations and partners that we work with, and we utilize that. 
So we have a, a collection of, of ways to connect to consumers that are existing consumers and consumers that we're trying to bring in for our multiple contracts that we have. Thank you so much for describing that. There's so many great ideas there. Um, lots, lots of different strategies. Can you identify any sort of specific or special techniques that you have for reaching out of school youth for minority backgrounds? Sure. So for this project specifically for these focus groups, um, we did several things to get our youth involved. First, I sent out a mass email blast to all our organizational contacts, organizations that work with adults and work with children, organizations that have after school programs, um, religious groups, community centers. So that mass email went out um, to, those, to those groups. We also use our social media platform um, like um, Instagram, Facebook, um, Twitter, and we also are starting to use TikTok because we know that um, young people are really into social media and that's really a great way to connect with them and to let them know that we are also trying to work with them on their level and communicate as best as we can using social media. We also, um, again, used our newsletters, um, word of mouth. We have a city action network, which is our advocacy um, groups where we talk to people about um, kind of the latest trends, what the needs are for people with disabilities living in the five boroughs. So sometimes um, these groups or activities are passed through those groups and through their church or through their local community center, they talk about, oh, you should join Sydney's group for such and such. So we did get a very robust um, response. Um, just over a hundred or so participants wanted to be part of the focus group. And um, that was a great, that was a great turnout for this activity. And we hope to work with all of those participants in the future. That's excellent. So it sounds like you are open to trying all sorts of strategies. And I really uh, respect that a lot. I know you were asking us if we could do a TikTok for, for the recruitment material. And I said, I don't know how to do that, but we can probably <laughs> figure it out. So. Yes, indeed, indeed. so one more question for you. Mm -hmm. What would you say is your biggest challenge with outreach? And then I'm curious if you have any kind of creative solutions to solve those challenges. Well, um, statistics show there's about 1 million um, people with disabilities living in the New York City area. Uh, and this is before COVID. And we know that post COVID, there's going to be much more individuals diagnosed with long COVID. So the reach of trying to get each and every person with a disability served is challenging. Our resources are limited. We know that there's a great need. And we also know through um, data that was provided by this project that people of color are highly impacted. Um, so we know what neighborhoods to really target um, within people of color um, in the Bronx and Queens, as well as uh, in Brooklyn, where there's a high incidence of people with disabilities. I would love to be able to connect to each and every one um, and provide services but I also know that the services are limited. I have a limited um, number of employees that can um, effectively serve as each and every one. But I want people to be optimistic. Sydney, we try really hard to go after a lot of funding um, because there's a lot of opportunities. But since we are a generalist, we serve every disability type. So we really try hard to, to get the funding that's needed. I want anyone listening, if you are in the New York City area, go to CIDNY.org, Sydney.org, and call us at 212-674-2300, uh, and we will help you as best as we can. Thank you. Thank you. That was great, great information. Thanks for your time. Just want to sure. remind folks that if you have questions for any of our presenters, you can drop those in the Q&A box, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. OK. Thank you so much. Thank you. So our next theme is on the next slide. And uh, so youth participants highlighted ways that SILs can keep them interested and engaged. So once they've outreached, they can keep them coming back. Next slide. So this is an important topic. 
so our youth video is a bit longer, but as you will see, Apple shares really good advice and tips. My name is Apo Gabriel, a 24 years old young man. I graduated in the year 2020 in my high school. Currently, I'm pursuing Bachelor of Commerce at University of Illinois State. I work part-time as a transcriber. My hobbies are watching movies, interacting with friends, reading novels, and also listening to music. Now you have a free marketing opportunity. So do you want to tell people what sort of business you're interested in starting? I want to venture into entrepreneurship, whereby I will be manufacturing milk products, such as yogurt, etc. And I hope all you, all of you will be my customers. I will yeah. be happy to see you all. Great. So now can you talk about what kind of things make you want to stay involved with the group or keep going back to a program? A group enables me to view myself as a part of that group. That is, it enhances the belongingness of, of that group. I recognize myself as a member of that group. The other thing is that in the group, I'm able to learn leadership skills that will help me very soon in my entrepreneurship business that I will be starting after my university course. The other thing is that I'm able to run listening skills to which a member of group views. I will also utilize these listening skills to when I start my business, whereby I'll be listening to my customers, I'll be taking their views. I'll also be listening keenly to my employees. You know, communication is very key in for the success of a business. So therefore, I'll be very keen and I will have a listening ears to all stakeholders in my business. The other thing is that I'm able to run the diversity of culture among different members of a group. Because a group may be made of different people from different ethnicity, and from that I'm able to learn different cultures from each person in that group. A group also enhances or strengthens the board or creates connection. That is not networking with friends. You, you, you have a chance to create new friendship and also board where uh, that friendship can be very helpful. For example, when starting my business, I need maybe partners who shall be sharing the same common goal. So a group basically helps me a lot. And the, the fact that in a group, many people are able to listen to me that boosts my self-esteem. I feel that I'm worthy and not, I'm not, and I'm not an inferior person. That really boosts my self-esteem. Great. Now, are there things that discourage you from staying involved with programs? Like, can you describe some of those things? Yeah. The thing one is that when the group loses it meaning that is when we draw our attention to other things other than the main focus or the goal of the group. I may feel that my time is wasted and I may be discouraged to continue in that group. Therefore, I would like a group whereby when we set goals or the purpose of the group, we stick to that. And that will <clears throat> save even our time and we will be focusing on the main things. Another thing is something that discourages me is when there is discrimination based on your ethnicity, based on your culture. That really hurts me a lot. It's not good to be discriminated. Yeah, that may discourage me from being a member of such a group. 
we should love each other we should try not to discriminate each other we are all one the other thing is that lack of respect for each members or for some members this is whereby some people may feel that their opinions are best and disregard others members opinion that is very bad in a group we are open to different opinion no one no one's opinion is perfect no one's opinion is right so everyone should be recent and discuss those opinion and come up with the best instead of neglecting some opinions thank you so much so i just have one more question for you what advice or tips do you have for organizations who are trying to engage out of school youth with disabilities from racial and ethnic minority backgrounds in programs i have three pieces of, sorry four pieces of advices the first one is these organizations should involve all people from these minority backgrounds or minority communities they should not discriminate any community they should involve all communities so that they can run or incorporate everyone in these programs the other thing is that they can partner with government or other organizations so as to complete their goals effectively the government could do some funding to this organization we know that when government is supporting a project or an organization the output work definitely would be much better compared to when there is no support or funding from the government the other thing is that these organizations should conduct surveys should conduct civil educations to these people of these minority backgrounds they should teach them and let them learn more about the program what's the what's the aim of the program the objective of the programs and what are the benefits that you gain as being a member of that program there are advices that the organization should lead by example they should employ these people from these different or minority backgrounds or communities to be their staff members in that program yeah that would be my advice for today my okay Thank you so much, Apple. I just realized that you said that having people listen to you builds your self-esteem. So I hope you are getting a giant boost. You and Aditya and Oliver have a large audience listening to you today and what you have to share is so important. So on this slide, we share key takeaways from our out-of-school youth participants. First, they said minimize barriers to participating in new groups and activities like transportation. So make it easy and convenient for them to get involved. Create a welcoming environment that prioritizes value and respect. Center equity, create spaces that are free from discrimination, racism, judgment, and other harm and specify expectations of participants and outreach materials. So for example, if there's any cost associated with an activity or if they need to dress a certain way, let them know up front so they, they can feel prepared. Next slide. So now I'm joined by Barbara Anderson from the Southern Illinois Center for Independent Living. Thank you for joining, Barbara. So I want to start by asking you to tell us a little bit about the programs that your so offers for youth. Okay, thanks, Kim. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we do quite a few things here at the Southern North Center for Independent Living. And the one that stands out the most to me right now is we have a fast track program. And our fast track is available for ages 14 to 21. 
And what we do, we can do one-on-one -on -one groups. We do classes in the schools, out of the schools. And we cover about 30 different points, subject matters uh, with, to the youth. And it involves work-based learning, advocacy, which is important on a daily basis in school at work. We also uh, workplace readiness. Um, and there's several other things that we cover money, money management, uh, communication, because those are things they're gonna need when they transition, you know, when they get a job and deal with the variety of uh, uh, people out, you know, uh, beyond, you know, their school. And they need that, uh, the communication skills at school also. So, plus we have our, there's a legislative program that we have too that the students are involved in where we can go to city council meetings, we can go online and look what's happening, you know, at the state level. Also, we have taken tours to Springfield to, uh, you know, up there, Abraham Lincoln and the uh, several places up there that the kids can get the knowledge of what's going on and that they can see the meetings happening there uh, at the Capitol. So, and plus, besides that, we have uh, the uh, a lot of different things for our um, youth out of school also. Now, our qualifications for this fast track program, like I said, they have ages between 14 to 21, and they can't be enrolled in the STEP program. Our, our, our lessons are, it's a transition, you know, 30 lessons for transition. And then that leads up basically to the STEP program that the state is involved in also. And we help kids find jobs, search for employment, resume building. We do mock interviews. We have taken the youth to um, businesses and to have mock interviews done so they can get that feel from the employer out there in the community. That is a lot. You have a lot going on. I'm wondering if you have sort of developed methods or strategies for, for making sure that out-of-school youth from minority backgrounds stay engaged and plugged in in these programs over a span of time. You mentioned, you know, 30 different topic areas. So how yeah. do you keep them looped in for the duration? What we do, besides the usual um, emails, texts, telephone calls, we let them know what's going on in the community and we invite them to form groups. The other offices, including uh, the officer in Carbondale, is forming uh, independent living groups, which would help with showing the student how to do laundry, how to cook, we have cooking classes, and anything else that they wanting to know, because you know with the, the sale office, basically we allow our consumers, it's consumer driven. So that's why we have to listen to our consumers so we can see what they need. And that's very important. So if it's basically you're looking for a job, looking for housing, you know, what availabilities there are. Um, we, I got a call yesterday about there's an agency, a business looking for students that are interested in cyber uh, security. So we're going to be setting up a meeting for them to come sometime this summer to do some recruiting. So basically, it's whatever the youth want. And of course, you know, when we have meetings, we got to have food. So, you know, <laughs> so anyway, but it's basically so they can feel comfortable and working with us either in a group or one on one. That sounds great. So that kind of leads into my next question. What other strategies do you have to just make sure that youth um, from minority backgrounds feel comfortable and welcome at these activities? At some point, we are basically with the group, there's the transportation. There's always a transportation issue, especially in our areas. But our 
sealed off as here and in other areas, we have some transportation, but we also train them how to do the city transportation, which is really inexpensive, like a, a, I think it's $2 a round trip from wherever they want to go. But basically, all these things are said, and they are trained to do that. We, for the transportation, we have taken them to the transit area, and so they can talk to the employers on how to go about scheduling, how to get back and forth, where they need to go and when and so forth. Um, also, the we have a community center in uh, Murfreesboro that allow the youth to come there, young adults, basically free to come in and play games. Uh, we can have meetings there and chat. So basically it's whatever the youth uh, feel as though they want to do and they set their goals and continue with those goals. And we're there to supervise and any other suggestions that they may have. Sounds like you offer it all. You've got fun, you've got food, you've got plenty of activity. <laughs> yeah. That's excellent. Thank you so much for sharing your experience and your strategies. That was very helpful. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So I just want to remind everyone, I, I see some action in the Q&A box, which is fantastic. We will get to as many of those questions as we can. And now I am going to turn it over to my colleague, Laura McDermott, to introduce our third and final theme. Thanks, Kimberly. My name is Laura McDermott and I'm a white non-binary person with curly brown bangs and I'm wearing black framed round glasses and a red knit sweater. The last theme we wanna share with y'all today is about youth recommendations for programs and activities at SILS. We're now gonna hear a video with some of Oliver's advice. My name is Oliver, Olivia, I just uh, turned 20 and uh, graduated from uh, high school. I am uh, currently working uh, part-time as a receptionist and a virtual assistant. I am hoping to join a uh, college soon and I am hoping to take a Bachelor of Commerce in uh, Finance when I join a uh, college. Uh, during my free time, I like to cook. I like to try new recipes from uh, YouTube. I also like to swim. I like to chat with friends and uh, play video games with them and other online uh, games. And I also like to watch movies, which are uh, documentaries to be precise. Yeah. All right, great. So can you talk more about the types of programs that would interest you and help reach your goals? First of all, I would be much interested in uh, programs that uh, promote spirituality that will help me grow more uh, spirituality. I would also uh, like uh, programs that uh, are uh, peer support groups. I believe that uh, I can benefit so much uh, through peer support and uh, help. I would also like uh, more programs on uh, talent enhancement, you know, to identify talents, to help uh, people grow talents. Yeah, that is uh, something I'd be very much uh, interested in. I am uh, getting ready to join a uh, college soon and I would love to help to get help in uh, applying for college and uh, scholarships. And uh, in case I need something like uh, the student loans, I would also like to get uh, guidance on uh, how to go about it, when and uh, where and uh, whom I should uh, talk to when I am going uh, through the process. So next, would you be able to talk about how connecting with other people with disabilities and other folks from similar racial and ethnic backgrounds as you can make a difference in your life? How does it feel to connect with people who are similar to you? I can say that uh, it makes me feel good when I remember that uh, I am not alone in this. There are people whom I am uh, sharing the journey with and that uh, I am not just, uh, you know, that one person who can be uh, spotted in the community as uh, oh, that girl with a disability or uh, something, no. So I feel uh, so much uh, confident when I know that um, I am not alone. 
and uh, it makes me uh, love myself more and it has helped me so much in terms of uh, being confident with uh, myself. What advice or tips do you have for organizations who are trying to plan programs for out-of-school youth with disabilities from racial and ethnic minority backgrounds? First of all, I would uh, advise them to make sure that uh, these youths are aware about the existence of uh, these resources. And uh, this can be achieved by uh, giving the information online or even uh, posting flyers that can be posted online or even distributed in person. And um, also for uh, the youths before leaving high school, they can be told about uh, the existence of uh, these resources and maybe given something like a flyer that uh, they can use uh, later when they need uh, these resources. The next thing I would advise them is uh, to identify the needs of uh, these youths. Uh, before creating uh, programs, they should make sure that uh, these programs are trying to address the needs of uh, the targeted persons, you know. I believe that is how uh, the youths are going to benefit from uh, the program once um, it is solving their needs and uh, once, yeah. All right, great. So in addition to what Oliver just shared with us, our youth focus group participants shared that it's really important for SILS to create opportunities for youth to learn new skills, hobbies, and have fun, to establish social support and mentorship programs, especially for youth from racial and ethnic minority backgrounds, for SILS to create community building opportunities that blend instructional and less formal activities, and to design targeted programs that can meet participants' independent living interests and goals. Next slide, please. So now I'm gonna be joined by Michael Hanna from ABLE South Carolina. Michael, are you able to tell us about how your programs have centered racial equity when working with out-of-school youth with disabilities from racial and ethnic minority backgrounds? Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to. Um, just to describe myself as well, uh, I'm a white male that's 30 years old. I wear glasses, I have brown hair and a, a beard. Uh, and I'd be happy to talk about how our programs uh, center youth uh, from uh, racial and ethnic minority backgrounds. So um, all of our programs are peer led. Uh, so it's their programs for youth by youth. So we go out, we develop programs, and the, the youth who are leading the programs are youth from the communities uh, that those programs are for. So it's, that is how we found each of these programs. So it's, it, by doing that, it's really easy to center these youth at the forefront of each of these groups. Yeah, that actually is really a nice segue into the next question I was going to ask you. So is there anything additional that you'd maybe be able to speak about um, how your programs, especially given that they're peer led, um, how that benefits youth in terms of connecting with peers and mentors? Yeah, um, let me, I, and it might be better if I talk a little bit about all of our different programs too. So our Equip program is a leadership group for youth with disabilities. Uh, we actually hire youth on and pay them as leaders. Uh, and we provide a whole bunch of different peer-led programs. So we have one-on-one -on -one peer mentoring. Uh, we do semi-structured groups called Hangouts where we kind of start with a topic. Uh, and by the end, it's more of just hanging out with each other. Uh, we do more structured social skills groups by request of our participants. And those are, are basically designed to build specific skills. Uh, most of those have been the communication skills recently. And we do that through playing different games. Uh, we also have built a discord, uh, and this has been a huge, like probably the biggest way that we've been able to connect, uh, all of our peers, uh, with, uh, other peers and mentors from across the state. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know what a discord is, if you use teams or Slack, or you've ever used a chat application, uh, before it's like that, uh, but you can create different channels. Uh, so our youth can stay connected 24, seven, 365. Uh, we can also use some moderation uh, bots that help keep everything uh, safe for them to use all the time. But 
it helps them stay connected. And it's really cool to see how they can stay connected with youth, not just from their individual communities, but across the state. And it really helps remove a lot of barriers. So when they need to reach out, they're facing something uh, that is a challenge in their life. They can reach out to that group and immediately connect with someone else. Uh, and really any time of day, we've had youth reach out at three in the morning and someone else is up, uh, not usually me, uh, one of the other youth, <laughs> and they immediately reach out and support each other. Um, we also have our summer series event, which is a skill building multi-day event. Uh, and similar to what Oliver was talking about before leaving high school, we've actually started partnering with our Department of Education uh, and multiple different school districts to build club programs that we call equip clubs, uh, where we actually uh, elect club officers and those club officers practice those leadership uh, and mentoring skills and lead groups uh, in school for their peers. And so we're connecting with them before they even leave high school. So that way we can keep um, them connected with each other uh, once they graduate. I love that. I love the continuity of care that your programs have. And I also really appreciate that both you and Dr. Sharon have both shared using Discord and using TikTok. And I think it's really important that we're incorporating social media and, and thinking about all these different apps that can help connect youth. Um, so the last question I had for you was, can you speak to how your program uh, helps each youth meet their individual career or independent living goals? Certainly. Um, one of the, the most like straightforward ways is our uh, equip leaders. So our equip leaders are hired on as staff. Uh, they work uh, the same as any of our other staff. They, they might have fewer hours, but they are responsible for the same work as anyone else. So uh, that allows them to build a resume, to build those professional skills. They're getting feedback and mentoring. Uh, that is the main part of my job because their job is to be those peer mentors, to design the groups, uh, to lead those groups. Uh, I'm not a, a youth anymore, so we depend on them to be the youth mentors. Uh, but I help provide the mentoring for building those professional skills, uh, and then they transfer those to their peers. Um, once they've reached their goal, we help design their uh, leadership, um, the equip leader's job around whatever their goals are. Um, once they've reached their goals, it opens up an opportunity for the next person. Uh, also, our participants aren't forgotten about in this either. Uh, if someone has an individual career goal uh, or an independent living goal, we, we work with them. So our peer mentors will connect with them uh, and try and work with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So we're working with them on helping them learn the skills on how to write a resume, on how to uh, like move out and live on their own, how to have the conversations about that with their family or their supports. Uh, we've gone and taught people how to do laundry and do like their dishes, how to clean. We've figured out what accommodations they might need. Uh, a lot of times people uh, haven't ever even thought about how they would do something because they've had people helping support them and doing those things before. But once they are able to find a job, all of a sudden they have the opportunity to move out on their own. Yeah, thank you so much, Michael. Thank you for so much for sharing. I just feel like, yeah, <laughs> this program, I'm like, wow, I kind of wish I was a youth again. <laughs> like, this <laughs> sounds like an amazing program and so many opportunities to connect. Um, so, okay, great. So that really wraps up all of our, our still speakers. And with that, I'm gonna pass the mic to Joey Vega to facilitate our audience Q&A. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Joey Vega. A quick physical description of myself is I am a Hispanic male with dark hair. I have a dark trim beard, currently wearing a uh, blue sports coat with a white, a white and blue plaid shirt. Um, so again, uh, this is going to be our Q&A portion. As a reminder, the slide does show my email address where you can send additional questions. But we're going to go ahead and talk about some of the questions that have come in during the um, presentation. So um, Dr. Uh, Sharon, uh, this question was uh, specifically sent for you. It says, for Dr. Weir, uh, what specific kinds of places <laughs> I'm what sorry. specific go ahead what specific kinds of places and communities of color do you target with outreach restaurant libraries etc do you find that one type is one type of place is best thank you for the question and, and i'm sorry that i neglected to give a visual description 
I am a black woman. I am totally blind. I have blue eyes. I have blondish hair and I um, live and work in, in New York City. Um, so essentially we find that we have to target everything. So library churches, community centers, wherever people with disabilities live, My we target. Yeah. So I wouldn't say one is better than another. Um, our goal is really to um, get as many people with disabilities um, to learn about our programs. And this is why um, using mass transit as a way of advertising is really helpful. Um, we use bus shelters. Um, we use um, the, 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 the kiosks in, in the subway system, as well as in the trains themselves where they have advertising space. So we really try to target as many people as possible. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I also do have a follow-up. Since you're currently on, I wanted to ask, it says, how would a SIL go about getting a federal city state contract as mentioned by you earlier? Very good question. Um, you have to have a very a tough skin because every contract that you write for, every grant that you apply for, you're not gonna get them all. Um, so you have to have a tough skin. You have to have a good grant writer. Um, you have to have a collaborative team, people that are willing to split up the, the grant in, 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 in sections uh, based on their strengths and what they, what they know. Um, you also need to be able to sell your sill, make sure that you know your sill and know that you can do it. And also let them know that um, you're working as a collaborative team and everyone is going to do the best that they can to apply um, for, the, for, the, for the contract, to work on the contract. You know, there's, uh, you also need to become, um, sign up for grants.gov, the various websites um, that you can get grants. Um, there's this foundation websites where you can get information on the various foundations within your area. Um, just basically getting attached to the philanthropy world. Um, Sydney's part of the Better Business Bureau. They have a lot of uh, events uh, where you could do meet and greet, coffee, you know, virtual coffee. Um, and that's a great place to, to contact with other business owners that may not know about people with disabilities, but um, they see that you're gonna need to buy stuff from them. So they're willing to work with you. Pretty much have a really um, holistic approach in, in trying to get as much money as you can. And the big things that independent living centers we do, we do a lot of donations. So work with your board, um, for them to give donations <laughs> and make sure that you try to advocate. Every dollar makes a difference. Thank you. Thank you for that, Dr. Sharon. Um, I do have a question. Uh, this is directed at Michael. Michael, do you mind hopping on? So the question, Thanks. So the question uh, said, states of the peer led groups, what type uh, do you think is the easiest to start with for SILs who don't have peer led programs yet? And the follow up question to, do, to that would be, how do you reach people with Discord who are further away, different parts of the state? Can you say more about the mod bots? So it's a multiple loaded question and I uh, appreciate your feedback on that. Uh, sure. I'm going to have to pull up our Discord so I can actually tell you which ones we use because uh, <laughs> I won't remember all of them off the top of my head. Our youth helped us set them up. Um, but that is something also I'd recommend because they're going to be better experts on some of the technology uh, than you will be sometimes. So I, I task them with helping make it safe. Um, so I think the Discord is something that is uh, deceptively easy because we can have a lot of really fun events uh, in the Discord. We, uh, our youth leaders host Dungeons and Dragons in there. We do chat nights. Uh, our creative writing group is one of the biggest groups now. They just did a joke night and I've never seen more dad jokes uh, in my life than the joke night. That was a, that was a ton of fun. Uh, they also have done a poetry night um, and a lot of other events, but uh, you can really host anything you want in a Discord group. Um, we uh, advertise it. We have a flyer that we've made. You can do a QR code. You can send invite links out uh, via email. Um, and sharing those with your partners is a really great way to get them out. Uh, and coming up with a, a good tagline, the more people you get in, the more that will want to join. 
uh, and just setting some good community guidelines for what you expect. Uh, one of our youth participants, uh, I think it was Apple, said that having clear expectations from the beginning makes it easier to participate in the group. Uh, a lot of our youth will hold each other accountable. Uh, and so that makes it a lot easier on us to hold them accountable too. Uh, and they really want a space that they can they can learn and support each other. Uh, some of the bots that we use in that group uh, are the, uh, we used Apollo for events, but Discord is updated to do events in Discord on its own now, so you may not need that one. Then for moderating, we use uh, Carlbot. Uh, we also have Circle. We have ModMail for if people have questions, they can send our moderators things directly. Um, we've added a pronoun picker. So when people register, they can pick their pronouns and add it as a tag. Uh, and then Simple Poll allows us to ask people questions in Discord uh, if we aren't 100% sure. Um, if you are not super tech savvy and Discord sounds really intimidating, the Hangouts are probably the other group that you could do. We do those virtually with, with Zoom like this uh, or Google Meet, and we do them in person. So you could do them out in the community, you could do them in your office, uh, and you can also do them virtually. Thank you for, for thank you for answering those questions. I do have a question for our youth. Uh, let me see. This question uh, for our youth is, I have noticed that adults tend to call you kids, even if you are 20, 21 or older. Does this bother you? What word or words would you prefer adults use when talking about youth like you? So I'd like to open this up to our youth who are joining us, Aditya, Apple, or Oliver, if you wanna unmute and turn on your cam and answer that question for us. I think that'd be very helpful. Can I ask on Apple to see if she, uh, if you can turn on your camera and unmute for this question? And thank you. I just noticed that uh, Oliver typed in the Q and A chat, so I appreciate that. Um, for um, Aditya and Oliver, feel free to do the same in the Q&A chat. Um, I do have a, another question, and so this one is coming in, and it's saying, great, present, great presentation. I'm wondering if your SILs have engaged youth to identify healthcare access barriers they are experiencing, and to find out whether youth are aware of their rights and how to file a complaint with the, the Department of Justice and DHHS or OCR. Do youth you work with have an interest in this area of advocacy. And I'll ask any of the uh, presenters from our SILs to uh, give your response to this question. Hi, this is Dr. Sharon, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Dr. Okay, Sharon. Okay, great. Um, so yes, um, part of advocacy um, at Sydney is to teach all, including youth, about their rights and how to go about making any appeals if they feel like they're being discriminated. Um, we also provide a lot of uh, services for health, 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 health programs. And we're now trying to offer some mental health services because a lot of our youth are greatly affected by anxiety and depression and also trauma. So we want them to know that physical health is just as important as um, mental health. Um, but yes, part of the advocacy is to definitely teach um, everyone how to advocate for their rights as a person with a disability. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sharon. Uh, Michael or uh, Ms. Barbara, would you like to uh, answer that as well? I think Dr. Sharon, 
uh, answered that really well. Uh, I know that sometimes what we'll emphasize too is going over and explaining uh, what their benefits are. A lot of times they'll they'll hear that their friend got something and they'll get upset that they don't have that, uh, or they'll feel like they need something immediately and it takes time. Uh, and then connecting them with the right people, uh, and so helping them understand that process uh, to go through, uh, in addition to how to make complaints and and how, understanding exactly what the rights are, uh, especially if they're feeling like they are discriminated against, we support them throughout that entire process. Thank you, Michael. Um, Ms. Barbara? Yes, Dr. Sharon uh, answered that thoroughly. Um, in addition to um, what she indicated and what Michael said, we have a representative here and they are working with uh, health issues with the lung COVID problem um, that a lot of people are not aware of right now. But I talked to a consumer, a young adult the other day, and basically giving them this information so they would be able to contact, you know, that person because sometimes they may not even realize after the COVID that has affected them and it could affect them for a while. And, you know, a person had lost their job and other people are having issues with this. So the information that we, uh, that is out there is very important and we should uh, see who else we can help with that. But, but yes, they need to advocate and we need to teach more on advocating, yes. Thank you, Ms. Barbara. Mm -hmm. So I have another question for um, our SIL representatives. Uh, one of them states, what support do SILs currently offer individuals who are deaf blind? Okay, I'll, I can jump in. Uh, all of our services that we currently offer are also available to any individual who has a visual or hearing disability. Um, if someone were to need additional support, so if we need an interpreter uh, or to use a, a different accommodation, uh, like we have to organize uh, an accommodation, uh, we we may ask for that to be let us let us know in advance that we can have that uh, prepared, but. Uh, we can braille any of our materials. We can organize uh, an interpreter to be there. Um, we can make sure that we adjust the font sizes, whatever accommodation uh, might be necessary for uh, an individual with a disability. We'll make sure that our services are accessible uh, for them to be able to, to participate. We have ways of getting in touch with interpreters. So if it's for an interview or even a visit here in our office, we also have technology that uh, we have access to, whatever the case may be. And then there's an office also in uh, Illinois, ITAC, where they have a lot of information, technical things that could be uh, borrowed, loaned out. So we do have access. And as long as we get, you know, some notice to the people to work out, you know, when we can get them the information, it can, we can help who's ever in need of that special equipment. Thank you, Barbara. Mm -hmm. Dr. Sharon, anything else you'd like to add? <laughs> Uh, no, I don't have anything else to um, add. I think that was a great answer. So I don't have anything. Um, do you need me to give some closing remarks or what would you like me to say? Um, no, I think that's- uh, That's it? Yeah. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yep, yep. So um, I'm gonna read out the youth responses um, out loud from the Q&A, just so everyone is able to um, hear that. Let's see, we have... Uh, 
So April Gabriel answered to the question, I've noticed that adults tend to call you kids, even if you are 20 or 21 or older, does this bother you? What word or words would you prefer adults use when talking about youth like you? And April's response was, I'm not okay with them calling me a kid. I would prefer being referred to as gentlemen. Thanks for your response, April. I also have one for uh, Aditya and it says, no, it doesn't bother me a lot. For our parents, I, even you are a 20 or 21 years old, we are still a child for them forever. So it looks like we have a little bit of a, you know, difference of opinions when indicated perhaps, you know, they refer to be as a gentleman and other, other one indicated they didn't necessarily have um, an issue being called as um, a youth or a kid. I also uh, have a question that was asked to Apple and all youth and it says, what makes you feel like you belong in a group? And Oliver's response was, a lot of things make me feel belonging to a group because of sense of belonging. It makes me feel comfortable and makes me feel that I'm not being judged by other members of the group. So I'd like to thank Oliver for responding to that question. Uh, but I would also like to take a moment to see if we have any questions um, from our attendees. Uh, please feel free to use the raise hand function so we may um, unmute and get that question submitted. And I did just receive an email with a question. It says, uh, does any of the SILs offer SSP programs for the deaf and blind community? I know we have uh, OIB program for seniors. I'm not sure uh, at what age bracket they're looking at or questioning. But I know we get a lot of equipment and we uh, deal with the uh, seniors in this program and take them equipment if it's for cooking, if it's for reading, whatever the case may be, but we do have that program. And thank you for that, Barbara. Mm -hmm. Michael, anything you'd like to share? Yeah, I was just gonna say that uh, we don't uh, offer the SSP programs through uh, our cell, but we are partnered with the Commission for the Blind. So uh, since they would be the experts in that field, we would uh, refer them to the commission and help facilitate that. Uh, if they had a specific skill they were trying to learn like how to cook, like Barbara was referring to, that would be something that we could uh, assist in learning. So if it was related to like that independent living specific skill, or if they needed help finding resources or filling out an application um, and learning how to do that, we could assist with that. So it would depend on specifically what they were working on, on whether it would be something that we would refer to like the commission or if it was a skill we could work on directly. Thanks for that, Michael. I do see two hands raised. Um, I'm going to call on Joita and see if you can submit your question. Um, our hosts and panelists will be able to see that. And I also see uh, Cynthia Gibbs Pratt has her hand raised. Go ahead, Joita. Hi, my name is Joetta Goldtooth. I'm Native American. I have really spiky hair, short, short, spiky hair. And I do wear reading glasses. My skin tone is somewhat oh, beige, I guess, light brown. And I am from the uh, Navajo Nation, a member of the Navajo Nation. And um, I've just kind of been listening to, I mean, 
each topic that is being addressed and where we live, where I live and where our independent living center is in Tuba City. And that's kind of like a remote area. I mean, really remote. And our um, assisted independent is the only uh, independent living center there. So overall, everything that you guys are talking about, I mean, that is that sounds great for youth and young adults, but we don't have access or how to get access to that where we live because the nearest somewhat big city is Flagstaff. And if we should go for any type of training or send our uh, participants for any kind of training, you know, um, we'd have to send them down to Phoenix or Tucson and sometimes to Denver. And it's really, really difficult. And I was just thinking, somebody said something about um, cooking and stuff like that. That would be great, you know, if somebody could come up to where we live, you know, and, and our office is not a huge building either. We're set up in a double wide trailer and behind the, the hospital, but we do have a kitchen and it would be great if, you know, somehow we could get directions to where we could get somebody up there to do some training. And right now we're only working with our coalition, which consists of, I think it was like uh, maybe 13, they're visually impaired and the other ones are, um, uh, confined to a wheelchair and so it's they're the only ones that we have been able to work with like pyramiding coalition and morning coffee just you know every Monday morning we talk with them and they talk with us to where you know to let us know and kind of shoot the breeze over about the weekend but as far as any type of programs we haven't started, and then on top of that, we don't have the funds for it. And earlier, I was watching another webinar, and they're talking about, you know, um, uh, uh, the bike, um, getting you know people to be able to ride together and things like that. And I thought, wow, that would be cool, but you know, we don't even have anything like that. I think the only any type of um, excitement that Tuba City would, could give is probably our local park and that they have a little uh, uh, a skating place there where all the youths get together. That's the only place that they hang out. We haven't really reached out to any of our schools yet because the schools are barely getting back on their feet because of COVID. And of course, I don't know if you guys are aware that you know Navajo Nation is barely coming out of you know um, being uh, the mask mandation, it's optional. And then on top of that, um, offices are barely opening up here and there. And so like our office, we barely started back into our office. We used to work from home, but started back in our office and I believe it was in November. So we're, we're back in our office. So we're trying to, you know, get back on our feet and we can't really reach out to other um, entities there because some of them are still closed and they work from home and it's hard to get hold of anybody. So, you know, all this that, you know, be, is being discussed is like, oh my gosh, I wish we had this. We could, you know, there was some, it would be so much where, you know, we could go out there into the public outreach and let them know that there's these programs available, you know, and so that they could come in and start up with these things because we know a lot of our youth need these these different type of programs that they could get into. And I know that our coalition would love to do a, you know, a cooking class. And I think that would be great. So I thought I'd just kind of put that out there. And thanks for bringing that up, Joetta. Um, do any of our panelists have any suggestions? Um, how, how is the internet connection uh, with your consumers? It depends on what day it is and how the weather is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that, that is completely fair. Um, I, I was The reason I'm asking is because the, the Discord has been uh, really, really great for us. I know COVID 
uh, has, has been really hard over the last couple of years. But with the virtual services, we got a lot of practice during that time because we were social distancing and doing so many virtual different services that uh, when we set up the, the Discord server, uh, that is free to host. It doesn't cost anything to, to set that up. Um, you can invite people uh, and they can join for free. It'll it'll say that you can like pay to be a part of it. You don't have to. Uh, it's just Discord's way of like trying to get people to raise money for things. It's completely free. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you can host things like the cooking class that you're talking about. One of our uh, equip leaders um, worked with one of our youth all the way across the state uh, and was teaching them cooking skills uh, just by them setting up their phone against uh, like the coffee on the counter pointing towards the oven and they baked brownies and it was the first thing that they had, had ever baked in their entire uh, life and that's how they learned how to cook for the first time mm -hmm. uh, and so it, it, it there's some opportunities I think there where you can do some uh, free like servers with discord and connecting virtually um, Discord is a program that youth, a lot of youth are already using. It's where a lot of youth that play video games, they're already using the Discord app um, and creating like a virtual flyer and sharing it with the schools uh, and through your partners with the schools. So like we shared it with our vocational rehabilitation partners um, was a big one where we, we shared it with them and they were able to share it out with the schools as well uh, and start getting people connected with us. Uh, it can be a way that you can get youth connected with you uh, for that peer mentoring as well. Mm -hmm. And so that All might right. be good. Sounds good. Yeah. Thanks, Joetta, for that question. And thanks, Michael, for responding. Uh, I did want to go ahead and uh, give Cynthia Gibbs Pratt the chance to ask their question. Hello, everybody. My name is Cynthia Gibbs Pratt. I'm in the central Pennsylvania area. I am, I guess I can say, I always, I like to make a joke about it. I am a chocolate brown woman with medium hair. Right now we're sitting in the Afro where I have on a pink shirt. So my questions are, I have two. One is I, I tried to put it in the chat, but it, I meant the question and answers, but it didn't go. So I put it in the chat. I am the one who asked about the SSP programs. I hear you guys talking a lot about um, the youth, the youth. I get that, but what if they do not, if you do not have an SSP program for the deaf blind community, like if they need to go shopping or go to the doctor or go pay some bills or who helps them at home with things, what other kind of services do you offer for the deaf blind? And, and is most of your programs at your sales directed only at youth and young adults. That's one. And the other is, oh, I wanted to make a comment on the young lady who mentioned the bike. It's called the tandem bike. I am also legally blind, diagnosed with macular degeneration 12 and a half years ago. In fact, I just came from the eye specialist and I was told it's not gonna get any worse. So I won't go totally blind by the grace of God. But yeah, do you guys have anything? Cause the tandem bike for me, I'm in central Pennsylvania. The closest place for me, if I wanted to ride a tandem bike or have someone ride with me, is all the way in Philadelphia, which is two and a half hours away. Like what other programs do you still offer for middle age and, and seniors? Like I'm a part of the still in the, in the central Pennsylvania area and we offer different programs for, for all disabilities of all ages. This is Barbara Anderson. Black female, wearing glasses, black and white top, and I currently have wavy black hair, black and brown. Now, our SEAL office, we deal with so many different people and ages. Uh, we've even dealt with people up into their 80s. So in school, uh, parents bring their children here. So we do with a variety of ages and there's a lot of different services. So I'd be more than happy to send you a list of all the services that we offer. And maybe uh, if I can get a location again, send you some, uh, get you in contact with another sale or some sales in your area, if that would help. 
That sounds great, but I'm still more concerned, a lot concerned about the SSP programs for the deafblind community. Like they don't have someone to help them go shopping, to go to the doctors, uh -huh. and, and uh -huh. it's pretty frustrating. Well, we, we do that. Well, we, 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 are, we have our independent living specialists that go to the homes, uh, take them shopping. We also have where they can get uh, uh, PAs, personal assistants also that help them through agencies and through our office. So our uh, staff is, they're helping them uh, with paperwork, whatever, whatever the needs are. So we have, and our staff is, you know, we have four different offices, but all of our staff are being trained to specifically do that. Okay, thank you. We can go in shopping, taking care of paperwork, the license, the, you know, you know, whatever they need, you know, for their apartments, their homes, their, there's so much that they're involved in. Okay, and thank you for that, uh, Ms. Barbara. So we're uh, getting close to the end of our webinar. So I just had one final question that I like to ask uh, Barbara, Dr. Sharon, and Michael. Let me see if I can get that queued back up. So um, this is for all SILs, all panelists presenting. How the, uh, the question is, how might you apply something they learn? How might you apply something that you learned today moving forward? There Based on is, yes. I have learned a lot with the different types of communications, how the outreach, and there's more work for us to do. We can never stop learning. And with the different questions that came up today, we, we need to gather more information how we can help all of our consumers. The outreach and like the lady, you know, was talking about the uh, uh, deaf and blind. There's we need to get those resources the best way we can and for our for whoever is in need and that's why the seals that's why we're here whatever the needs are i know the seals try to meet basically whatever the needs are out there if we don't have it we can try to locate it thank you barbara michael I'm going to echo what Barbara said because that's that's what I was thinking as well. Uh, a cell is supposed to be a place that anyone with a disability can go, and it's a part of their uh, community, and they should be able to go there to get support. Um, and so, if it feels like it's a, a space that you aren't going to be able to get support, then we need to do a better job about uh, making it clear that you can and how to make sure that you're getting those accommodations and connect with us. So. Uh, that's an area that I think we can grow. Um, also, uh, if it seems like there's a lot of interest in the the Discord, uh, maybe some of my uh, equip leaders could put together a guide one day to on how to set one up. I think they would enjoy that. So, thank you. And uh, Dr. Sharon, uh, any anything else you'd like to add before we start wrapping this up? And if you come back in, we'll, we'll definitely acknowledge that. But um, again, thank you uh, to our panelists, to our youth. If we can go ahead and advance to the following slide. So uh, the slide here is our references to access the recording of today's webinar, the slide deck, focus group practice briefs, and more information about MySEL. Please visit the event page, which will be dropped in the chat. And we can go on to the following slide. Again, we also have a slide with contact information for our MySIL colleagues, as well as each of the presenters for the SILs featured in today's webinar, which can also be accessed from the event webinar in your slides. And our last slide. Again, we just like to thank you um, 
for joining us today on this very informative topic. As you've seen, my colleagues drop multiple links in the chat. We do ask you if you could take a moment to uh, complete our post event questionnaire. Um, it will be presented on the last slide. Uh, if Sharon or Dion can drop that for us one last time, your feedback is very helpful and valuable and it allows us to make sure that we can continue with the Minority Youth Centers for Independent Living Project. All right, and with that, again, thanks again for joining us. Uh, Kimberly, I'm not sure if you wanted to close out and say any last few remarks. We have about two minutes. Sure. Thank, thanks, everyone, for your thoughtful questions and your engagement with this information. Thank you to the youth participants for sharing your experience with us. It was so valuable. I can hear the wheels turning in all of our audience's mind thinking about how to incorporate some of these great tips. And thank you to the still uh, pres presenters, um, Barbara, Dr. Sharon Weir, and Michael Hanna. Thank you all so much. Take care and we will look forward to future updates on the MySil project.